Hello, everyone, and uh, welcome to another one of my uh, webinar interviews. Today, I'm very pleased to have with me once again, Michael Sauter, Mike Sauter, who lives in near uh, Geneseo, uh, uh, New York, near the Abbey of the Genesee in what? Now, I want to get this right. Pifford, right? No, not Pifford. Yeah, no, no, no. Uh, the, so I go against your intuition. Whatever you think, say the opposite. So it's Pifard. Pifard. Yes, Same I got it wrong name, last time. New York. Yeah. And, okay, Pifard. All right. And uh, Mike is a uh, campus minister at uh, New York University on the uh, in Geneseo. Uh, so, and then we also have Michael Martin with us today. Michael Martin is, might be known to a lot of you. Uh, he's written books on sociology. He also has a blog. What's the name of your blog, Michael? Uh, the Center for Sociological Studies. That's right. The Center for Sociological Studies. I apologize. I was super busy this morning. Did not get a chance to do my usual bios on people. So Michael Martin also, uh, he's written on sociology. He's got a blog. He and Mike Sauter now have a new podcast. And the name of that is what? Regeneration? That's right. The Regeneration Podcast. The Regeneration so Podcast. I, I yeah. So I encourage, I've listened to it. And it's fantastic. I love it. And it's actually the fact that you guys booted that up and got that going that made me realize I want both of these guys on my show so I can say before they were super famous, uh, they, oh, were, yeah. they were they they were were on my show. Yeah. So And Very Mike Martin runs a farm. In a mercenary. <laughs> well, just remember me when you come into your riches. That's all oh, I yeah. want to know. When you when you become filthy, stinking rich. Uh, 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 and you run a farm in Michigan. Is that not I correct? do. Yeah, That's and right. In where, fact, where, go ahead. Well, this one, just 20 minutes ago, I, I was in the bathroom and I looked out the window and there is my steer outside of the of the pasture. So we had to go catch him. How did so, he get out? Somebody left the gate open. Oh, somebody. Have, one, one of my kids. Well, we moved them from another pasture last night and somebody forgot to shut the gate. Wow. So you have a steer. We uh, The most ambitious I get with... Uh, sort of animal we have sheep and goats we just recently have gotten back into the dairy goat business which is a lot of fun for me because i love i love goat milk and i love goats goats are the they are the court jesters of the animal world on any farm goats I are think. the goat right uh, and so they are i've never quite understood the biblical hatred for goats because uh, we also have sheep sheep are quite stupid <laughs> they're as dumb as a two by four whereas goats have personality know their names do you, you think the you goat repeat a sheep's it has to do with their that their pupils are kind of square that they just look a little bit fey if not demonic yeah and oh, the, and that's my that's the, always the been horns, my thought the, yeah well it's also that they can be mischievous so maybe i don't know Absolutely. what it's all about uh but anyway enough of that yeah. i used to uh, bring a brief brief story i used to bring i had two goats that were at my home and I would bring them into the campus ministry uh, office maybe twice a year. Therapy goats. Obviously, it was just a moniker thwapped on a non-existing reality. But after after about 10 years of doing that, I didn't know how many students who had graduated. But yeah. Okay. Mike is freezing up on this. Yeah. Mike's froze up. Um, yeah, you froze up just a little bit, Mike, but uh, you, okay. I think you're back now. But so why don't you repeat what you just said? All right. I see you guys. Oh, it's just how I bring, just uh, around finals time, I would bring my two goats, uh, Bernice and Adelaide, the office here and keep them outside and students would come up and say hi. But I called them the three aunties, uh, even though there was two. And I called them the professional therapy goats, the three aunties. <laughs> and uh dunes really got they really it, it drove them crazy the three two thing but then after uh years i still hear it now that they'll refer to my therapy goats as if they were professionally certified and trained some unique purpose so uh, be careful what you tell young impressionable college well people. it's true but goats seem singularly well disposed towards me i think therapy i love they them do. i absolutely love them they are they, they, they are do. masters of escape uh, yeah. so you better have a good fence, but I love them all the same. Anyway, let's let's get on to the to the topic of the day. What what really interests me about uh, the Regeneration podcast and with so much of Michael Martin's uh, work of late is the the issue of sociology. 
And I have to admit, I mean, I'm very drawn to sociology, but uh, I'm not an expert in sociology. I'm a kind of dilettante in it. I've read some Bugakov, some Louis Bouillet, uh, and, and some essays here and there, some Michael Martin. Uh, but I have to admit, I have a rather vague idea in my head as to what sociology is. So, Michael, perhaps you could start us off. Mike Martin. I got two mics here. I'll refer to Mike Martin as Michael and Mike Sauter as Mike. So we'll make the distinction. So, Michael. That's the way we do it. The, yeah, it works. For the viewers, if you can sort of nutshell, what exactly is sociology? Why is it important, especially maybe for today? Uh, well, it's kind of complicated because there are... Uh, you know, any one definition you give is insufficient, as you know. Right. But uh, there are different iterations of it. So, um, first of all, you can say it's uh, based on a kind of intuition of of the wisdom of God, of Sophia, in in creation, and that's something you see in. Uh, in, mo in modern iterations, it, it started with Jakob Burma, the German mystic in the 16th, 17th centuries. Um, and he had kind of unique insights about uh, the Sophia of Proverbs and her relationship to the Virgin Mary. And he interpreted the, the Virgin Mary as the incarnation of Sophia, much as, you know, Jesus right. is the incarnation of the Christ, right? So, so that's one intuition, and there is some, I don't know if we could say evidence, but there is some discussion, I don't know if you're familiar with Margaret Barker's work, right? when she talks about the presence of the, the divine feminine in First Temple Judaism, you know, though it's, it's kind of speculative, it's very interesting. And it, it points out to, uh, like I mentioned, Proverbs, Proverbs 8 in particular, but also in the Book of Wisdom and the Book of Sirach, which were both composed in North Africa by Jews in exile, uh, that that there there seems to have been what we call a hokma or wisdom tradition, at least uh, kind of a sidebar anyway from from mainstream Judaism, uh, but definitely a part of it in a way. So there's that. There's also uh, the kind of Russian version you were talking about with Bulgakov, which started with actually Vladimir Sloviev, and Bulgakov picked it up, so did to a certain degree uh, Nikolai Burjayev and also Pavel Florensky. And then from them, it went to Bouyer, because Bouyer knew Bulgakov. And in his book, The Throne of Wisdom, which is a fantastic book, is, is basically a Catholic iteration of Bulgakov in a way. Um, so there's that kind of philosophical, theological uh, s stream, you could say, that's that's kind of Russian. <laughs> and then it filters from the Russians into Catholic theology, where you see it in Bou as Bouillet, as you mentioned, but you also see it in Teilhard de Chardin. Right. In his, in his kind of beautiful prose poem, uh, The Divine Feminine. I think I know what it's, what it's called. Um, but also you see it in Thomas Merton. To a degree, yeah, and and I think it's very present in in Van Balthazar, your guy. Right? Oh, he sure is, especially in when I so when I it was this gosh back in graduate school, and I was I was researching uh, for my dissertation. I did a chapter on the metaphysical poet Henry Vaughan and his twin brother, the Anglican priest and alchemist Thomas. And they made a lot, you know, they had a kind of a sociological thing going on. But then the last chapter I did in my dissertation was on Jane Led, who was a Philadelphian. Jane Led was, uh, if you would call her an English beaminist. She was a English kind of disciple or a follower of the, the writings of Burma. And so was John Portage, her, uh, her kind of teacher. And they were kind of uh, Sophia mystics so it's kind of so so anyway we, what you see happen is you see this protestant iteration that comes from burma and from burma it goes to well it goes to england 
but that uh, and so there's an English strain of sociology which you see in in the metaphysical poets, not all of them, but certainly in Thomas Vaughan, uh, Henry Vaughan, and in Thomas Traherne. De definitely read Burma and definitely took sustenance from it. Um, but and then you see this Russian stream that came from Burma to and it went to uh, Soloviev and from Soloviev to those other guys I mentioned. And so that is kind of a philosophical philosophical or the, theological school of sociology where Bulgakov in particular was trying to create a syst systematic theology based on this this intuition of Sophia's presence in the world, which got him into a lot of hot water. <laughs> I'm sure it did. Well, yeah, I know it I think, did, yeah. That's what I think happened with Von, Von Balthazar. I think, uh, well, anyway, the story was going to. So I was doing all this research on, on those figures, and I said, damn, somebody should write a book about this, which ended up being the submerged reality. But uh, when I read the introduction to the first part of the glory of the Lord, the, the part with what's the title on beauty yeah uh, the, the first glory, 100 pages see see in the form seeing the form seeing the form one. yes <laughs> yeah those first and 100 that, pages man they're amazing it, they are amazing and you could it was just you know it was this uh shining sophiology all over the place there yeah so it, so my take i don't know what you think is that von balthazar was keep trying to keep it on the down low because he saw what happened to the Lubak and uh, and Chardin. So he was trying trying to toe the line. That could very well be. I think to a certain extent, he and so many others who operated under the pre-Vatican II, you know, holy office and its strictures and its condemnations of la nouvelle theologie and yeah. its elevation of two-tiered really absurd neo-scholastic notions of nature and grace. Yeah, he saw all that. On the other hand, and, and this goes to a certain nuancing of Balthazar in this sophiological tradition, Balthazar was very critical, actually, of Teilhard de Chardin. Uh, this was one area where he and his friend de Lubac differed sharply, because de, Lub de Lubac was a, a, a big supporter of, of Teilhard de Chardin. Mm -hmm. But uh, Balthazar had some very caustic almost polemical things to say about Teilhard because he believed that Teilhard's sociology embedded within an evolutionary context. I think, I think Balthazar thought it was stressing too much the path of imminence and not enough the path of an eruption, an eschatological eruption of God, mm -hmm. you know, from the transcendent side into time and space. And I think he thought Teilhard's evolutionism created a, a too seamless path from alpha to omega without yeah. the rupture that is the cross without that christic moment that is the cross mm -hmm. now i don't know if that's fair to Taylor. all i'm saying is that's balthazar's critique of him i think it's a fair critique i mean it, you know i you can definitely see that in Taylor. yeah but uh, but 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 on the other hand uh sir naturel right by de lubac it's a very different, very different take on things, and I think that's maybe why De Lubac defended Teilhard, not as much as that he was always right, but that he, he deserved a hearing. Yeah, I think that's correct. I think that's absolutely correct, and that yeah, and that's why ahead, I look Mike, at those. Go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I wanted to. I was just. It was, it was just to say, Mike... be the uh, you know even reading say Tomberg on those guys, specifically Teilhard. There's there's an admiration I think that we need in the church for spiritual explorers, you know, and bad they did what they did. But as as my friend Michael was saying, you know, I have some reservations on TR's project too. Um, but uh, Delubach probably having been, you know, on the uh, he would have he would have definitely had some solidarity with Tayard. Uh, but you know, again, I'm always trying to put out my own writings, just like during this time, you know, a sociology stand against a form of scientism for sure and we'll go into that but uh on the other hand real science like explorers looking for things we need to raise those people up so in one sense Teilhard, you're probably wrong on a lot of things the other Teilhard, for at least thinking outside the box especially in the catholic tradition mm -hmm. you know yes uh I, I i you know um i think like that's a very important i we could really go off on a tangent here and maybe a future interview and discuss 
the many, many ways in which the pre-Vatican II church uh, erred and erred greatly in its approach to precisely that kind of creativity of thought, that, that creative fidelity, because Teilhard was anything but a raving lunatic heretic. You know, he was, he was a faithful son of the church who was just very speculative. And he, and he was try he was one of the first people to try and bring together modern science and, and Christic Christologically oriented uh, theology. Yeah, exactly. And so, you know, hats off to the guy. And instead he just gets these coals of condemnation heaped on his head. And the same mm. with De Lubach. So I, I agree with you completely that we need more outside of the box thinking so long as that doesn't mean just getting rid of the box entirely. <laughs> I, I wrote okay. that someplace, you know, yeah, outside, yeah, of, yeah. outside of the box thinking is easy when you begin first by burning the box. Uh, boxes have their role to play. Uh, but I often say that w the, the, the box needs to be a semi permeable membrane rather than a wall. So, uh, that allows for this creativity. But anyway, that that's a sort of whole right. different ecclesial history story about freedom of thought and freedom of expression. But I agree with you. I think De Lubach was simply sympathetic to both Teilhard's project, but also to the fact that he suffered under the Holy Office in very, very unfair ways. Um, but I do want, so I, but I, then I want to come back then to, uh, to both of you, but I'll start with Michael Martin. Would you not then characterize the sociological tradition, and this is my take on it, as part and par at least in its modern iteration, uh, as part and parcel of the modern theological and philosophical rediscovery of the way of imminence? Yes. Uh, uh, so maybe comment on that. Well, I think it's, I think that we're, this is my guess, but I, my supposition is that in the 20th century, Part of the reason that sociological sociology moved out of the shadows a little bit, even though a lot of you know Catholics, especially, have never heard of it, is that it accompanied the discovery of phenomenology. And just like so in Husserl and Heidegger, even even Rudolf Steiner, who all came out of that phenomenological tradition where the idea is by beholding phenomena in uh, in a non-judgmental space which allows the phenomena then to re disclose themselves or reveal themselves to us but, and this is what I think von Balthasar was really interested in because it's not only in natural phenomena like you know like goats <laughs> yeah or, yeah, but it's also in the arts, right? And this is why what I think motivated von Balthasar is when, and he that's why he calls it the glory of the Lord. But that's that the that with the splendor of God, which is Sophia, as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, that shines through the universe at those moments when we have to be in in a kind of a proper space to receive it, right? Yes, like for poetry, for instance. I mean, you can or scripture. You can read a line of scripture, pass it hundred times, but or a poem hundred times. But then there's, there's that one time when it opens up, and well, this is this happened. I this great example I always use, but it's it's worthwhile of Simone Weil, who uh, in which which we, as she was being drawn toward Christianity, she was given a book of the metaphysical poets and. She found uh, a poem by George Herbert, which is generally titled Love Three. And she liked it so much, and it's actually a very Eucharistic poem. She liked it so much that she, she translated it into French and she memorized it. And whenever she felt a migraine coming on, she would recite this poem to herself, you know, and she, and she wrote in a letter to her priest that eventually it took on the virtue of a prayer and during one of these recitations, she said, in her words, Christ himself came down and took possession of me. So the, to me, that is, um, you know, that's that's a phenomenological, non-judgmental mental engagement with with the phenomena, right? right. Which allows right. it, which which allows it to reveal itself. And I and I wrote an essay. It's in my book. Uh, uh, 
the incarnation of the poetic word um, about this, because sometimes, you know, when you say the, the poem by George Herbert, I mean, and he, I know this is a literary scholar, is that you, you pay attention to the to this poetry. You say you're reading a lot of Thomas Traherne, then you get you get to a point you feel like you you met Thomas Traherne. You know, like like right. And then right. In, in some of the poems, and this is what happened with with, with Simone Weil, not only do you feel you're you're in the presence of the poet, then in her experience, she was in the presence of he who the poet was addressing. So yes. it's kind of, which is what I think, you know, draws us to experiences of beauty in the, in whether it's in the arts or liturgy or nature or whatever it happens to be, because this once is, you see it, yeah. you can't unsee it. This is so true. Um, and I'm going to get Mike Sauter's take on this in, in a second. But what you said about, you know, how you can read something over and over and then it suddenly strikes you for the first time. I think we've all had that experience. I mean, the, think of the scriptural line, you know, uh, God sent his son in, you know, in the fullness of time. And I've read that a hundred times. The other day I was reading it and I, I suddenly stopped and it really struck me. What does it mean to say in the fullness of time? What fullness? <laughs> Whose time? And without further explanation. And man, that sent me on like an hour long uh, meditation and a possible new blog post that runs too, too long <laughs> yeah. uh, down the road. But Mike Sauter, what, what, what is your take on what Mike Martin just said about imminence and, and, and phenomenology and all that? Yeah, you know, he 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 did all to answer yes, yes, yes. You know, so that's one for me, polarity, transcendence and immense. The other one, you know, which is kind of like so close it's in our face is the male female polarity, right? We'll often right. refer to it. Not and Michael and I, we speak a similar language. I'm sure it's different in many respects. But so much of sociology for me has to do with the real, right? So I'm all uh, trumpeting certain authors that I think, you know, where are sociological masters. Modern ones would be this John Sullivan, uh, French novelist. The other one that I'm always mentioning is John. But John Cooper Powell is regarding the women. And here we can think of von Balthasar, you know, in that great passage where he talks about scientism and technology and a world without women. And I, I forget what book it's in. I, but that's in Michael's book, yeah. Submerged Reality. But Powys talk about women as, and I love this, um, reality addicts, right? Think of the women we know. You know, Kurt Vonnegut used to give a commencement address, uh, and he changed it from school to school. But one thing was universal. He always asked young men to marry women who had sisters, because he said, women need to tell somebody everything that happened to them in the day. <laughs> and he goes, it's going to be better if it's your wife's, <laughs> right? Right. You know, and then, this is tied into the whole notion of gossip. Bob said women are reality addicts. And he even gave the image of Julius Caesar, the opposite men. Men, of course, will use ideas to put a buffer between themselves and the real world, right? We're so masculine. Uh, no, we're hiding from the real using concepts between us and the reality of the world. And the image Powys also gave us was that he said that Julius Caesar, upon going into battle, wrapped up in gauze, right? That even he, reality was too much for men to take. So the uh, the male-female polarity is something too, imminent transcendent, but the feminine charism. Uh, the, and the one I just want to brief one was what we call the real, you know, um, which is the opposite of the transhumanism and the agenda being foisted on us. So Mike Martin, in a very crucial chapter for me in his book, Triguration, um, you know, I would want to tell every young person trying to figure out the world, let left and right go first and foremost. Throw that as far away from yourself as you can. There's a whole other ways of just need to jettison. But Sophia versus Araman, and maybe Michael can tell us more about that later. But, you know, the feminine charism versus the technocratic thing that's descending on us. It's the of our time. But, you know, a long answer to a short question. Yes on imminence. Let's add this feminine thing and talk about it overtly. Um, and clearly, you know, the church needs it. I have been, uh, that is brilliant. And I want to get into this technocratic thing. And I know it's something that interests all three of us. Uh, but I was remiss at the beginning in introducing Mike Martin that I did not talk about his publications, get, you know, their names and so forth. But you just mentioned one, Mike Sauter, that I think is, is my favorite. I think it's very important. Uh, 
the submerged reality. And and I really hope people can go on Amazon and and send Mike uh, Michael Martin into the wealth zone. <laughs> <laughs> Shoot it this up. This is gonna there. do it. This is gonna do it. Yeah, yeah. My my videos always go viral, Michael. So just be aware that your your fame is about to skyrocket. <laughs> I think I have uh, maybe four hundred, five hundred <laughs> subscribers. Uh, I remember once. Uh, I don't want to get off topic, but when I interviewed Bishop Robert Barron, he talked about how Word on Fire actually started. And I'm not saying I'm going in that direction. He said, but Word on Fire actually started. You know, doing his sermons on YouTube in Chicago, and he he, he recounted how how they were thrilled when they would get 400 hits on a video or 500 hits on it. They thought that was Shangri-La. But of course, now that's the multi-million dollar word on fire. I'm not headed in that direction, but I, I'm definitely in the, oh, wow, 400 people watch this. That's amazing. Um, so at any rate, I think, yeah, your publications, that's Michael. Are, I think your publications, Michael, are very, very important. And I would encourage people to go to Amazon, click on books and Michael Martin's name, and uh, you're going to be uh, – the books are very readable, by the way, very readable and accessible, and uh, that's one of the things I like about them. But anyway, let's let's talk about this and technocratic impulse. Oh, they are funny, as is his blog. Uh, yeah. My blog can be a little funny, too, at times. Although yeah, it's got, it, mine has gotten a little less funny. Yeah, well, my, yeah, but lately, ever since no. I, but anyway, I, I've gotten far too serious lately. I've gotten actually sidetracked lately too much in ecclesial politics, which I think is bad. <laughs> uh, I need to, re I need to, I need to return to my own sophiological, theological uh, roots rather, uh, rather than commenting on political things. But anyway, technocracy has, I'm, I'm big lately on the thinking of the late Italian philosopher Augusto del Noce. I don't know how familiar you guys are with Del Noche uh, and his thought, but his his thought his claim is that the the religion of the modern world is scientism, uh, and he's not the only one to make this claim. But I think he's one of the few people to make it a kind of singular focus, to make it a, a kind of hermeneutical thread that runs through everything that he writes, hammering home this idea that if you want to understand the modern world. You need to understand its rejection of spiritual things. And it's therefore the rejection of both the way of transcendence and imminence in favor of simple scientism and technocracy uh, as, as the only meaningful things in our existence. So I, this time I'm going to bend with Mike, Mike Sauter. Um, Mike, do you think that is correct? Do you think Del Noche is, is correct in that, in that regard? Or would you like to nuance that? 50% and a little bit. Um, you know, another person, and so we can bring in the name, you know, who we didn't mention was uh, Thomas Merton, you know, one of the, one of the best uh, uh, books on Merton that I've read. Um, oh, uh, this, it's on Sophia. Lay, uh, you know, Sophia's interest in his, uh, Merton's interest late in his life in Sophia, you know, in the great poem. Hagia Sophia. Hagia Sophia. Yeah. Merton was reading all these Russian Silver Age theologians. But the connection with Merton is that another person who made his full paradigm this same one that Del Noche did, uh, which ties in William Blake. Kathleen Rain begins a seminal essay on William Blake saying, William Blake put the whole world through the lens of science versus the Im imagination. Remember that for William Blake, the imagination was another word for Jesus, Jesus, the imagination. So Blake's whole corpus, and Thomas uh, Merton, of course, did, I guess, his master's thesis, you know, is quite conversant with Blake, which I think is, you know, even an unexplored enough part of Thomas Merton. You know, people are, how many people make it their full-time jobs to go into Merton's writing? But in the Genesee, we need more of this. But it's um, it's what makes Merton so relevant when he's so easily brought down into a bland kind of a leftism in the church. You know, he's so reduced. But Yes, yes, yes. Not only is it the paradigm of Del Noche, it's the paradigm of Blake, who we need so much. Again, Blake's three antichrists were Newton, Locke, um, and, and uh, the the this uh, the God. You know, it's very nuanced what he does. But Eurism, which could be short for your reason, which I'm going to say, you know, the one of the best books I've read recently was this guy who wrote a book called William Blake in the Left Hemisphere. I'm forgetting his name, but a brilliant, brilliant book. But all this stuff is related, this analytical mind. Um, and the Catholic Church 
is inhabiting this same area, right? Uh, Father Isaac at the monastery, who you know, he told a story of uh, B.F. Skinner and how B.F. Skinner's students one time were in a lecture hall. And when B.F. Skinner was, they wanted to make him lecture, just talk from one side of the uh, auditorium. So when he, he was from the center engaged, and when they, when he would move over to the right, they looked more energetic. And by the end of the lecture, he was just on one little precipice of the right side of the stage. You know, so he trained his actions into how to be. But I want to say we're all left-brained, flattened out automatons now. And we better get on this stuff and we better get it on quickly. So what we have with yeah. the Catholic right is uh, on transhumanism and on abortion. They're right. But they're saying it, so many of them, and it's not all of them. They're saying it from the same type of language uh, that a technocrat. Um, so we're, we're Catholics, you know, we're all these flattened out people, but, and it, it keeps some sanity as, with us if we have the right dogma, the right doctrine on, on these things. Uh, you know, sociology can move us. I feel, it's, it's been true in my own life, that when, when, you, when you invest in the real and the lion's share of your life is in, in some form of lacrimose pot, the great nobo daddy in the sky, then our our prophetic stance vis-a-vis, say, transhumanism and abortion, it's as natural as breathing, right? Right. But it doesn't, uh, so yes to everything. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, yes, I agree. Uh, there's a reason, too, why Balthazar did not begin with Kant, as Rahner did, but started instead with Goethe. Uh, and uh, yeah, and and he and he says that explicitly. That was he, in Rodney House there's introduction to Kant Balthazar. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, he says it explicitly, and, public, maybe, and that says the whole world, right? Kant is right, and is a Ranarian, Goethean, and Von Balthazar is a Goethean. That says yeah, so I much. Mean, yeah. So many people always want to know what was this falling out with you and Rahner? What's the essence of it? And Balthazar got exasperated with the question. He goes, "Well, it boils down to Kant versus Goethe," and. Uh, so an interesting question then that I would then propose to both of you, but we'll go down to Michael Martin is, can you formulate, well, obviously you can, and Del, this would be part of Del Noche's critique. We made a choice to fashion science in a particular direction in this Baconian power, technocratic, manipulative direction, reductionistic, scientistic. Exploitive. But, exploitive, mechanistic, dominating, rapacious, uh, all these things. Could we have developed science out of Goethe instead of Newton? That's actually the, the opening chapter of my book, Transfiguration. Is it's about exactly. that exactly? Yeah. Yes. That I think had we start had we followed Goethe and not Newton, we'd be in a much different place because his 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 starting place with phenomena is in reverence, not in exploitation. And in fact, he called the Newtonian paradigm, the mechanical and empirical dogmatic torture chamber, because it submits phenomena to torture. And if you, if you read so many of those, uh, and because my, my expertise in literature is the 17th century. So you read a lot of polemical religious tracts, but you also get immersed in the scientific revolution at the time. And Bacon and uh, Descartes, they all speak in these terms of torturing nature to make her reveal her secrets right which was anathema to goethe the poet as well as the scientist so yeah i think if we would have taken that approach boy you imagine how how different uh our understanding of the world would be you know because we're all conditioned by the scientific even this you know the dumb science classes we take and elementary school and high school, which give you the conclusion and, and, and give you and tell you the process to come to that conclusion. I mean, come on. Yeah, <laughs> that's not and, science. And good to good to emphasize the organismic whole, which is I, I, one of the things I think that w attracted Balthazar to him, of course, form, splendor, mm -hmm. the whole, uh, das ganz im Fragment, the yeah. whole in the fragment. Uh, rather than taking dust guns and reducing it to to, to fragment, um, so but my, my my question would be then this: a very one of the accusations that is often leveled against me, uh, and perhaps against both of you as well, is that and now wait a minute, guys, it's all well and good. You guys are all these theology farmer poetry type dudes, all into wisdom, so theology, all your squishiness. But the fact of the matter is, 
the fact of the matter is modern science works. Okay, we've got antibiotics, airplanes, flush toilets. We can we can send a spacecraft to Mars and we can land it on Mars within three seconds of a predicted time based on Newtonian principles of, of motion, gravitation, speed, velocity, and so on. So what would you say to, to, to I, I'll start with Mike, Mike Sauter again, go down to Mike, uh, Michael Martin. What would you say to that, to that criticism of, well, it's all well, well and good to talk about science in the way you do, but haven't you reduced science to poetry? Isn't science by definition about helping humanity through controlling nature in ways that have been beneficial? Mike Sauter? Funny. Yeah, I would say this, the, yeah, the, the type of science of blasting off into the moon and everything in Mars and Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos. Again, we have to see it as a <laughs> lot with this brain hemisphere stuff. And I want to put it on the map again with Ian McGilchrist, you know, great British psychiatrist, his book, The Master and the Emissary. But for me, and I've written a lot at front porch about this, what I do know is that type of science is very left-brained and it's how the adolescent mind works too, right? And it's also the adolescent imagination blasting off into, into space. It's ultrally... It's also culturally to what Oswald Spengler called the Faustian age, where our theme is always to infinity and beyond. There's whole cultures that produce beautiful, beautiful things that didn't reduce everything to just like endless rocketry, right. endless gunpowder. The second one would be, you know, if you can use the example of just cancer for one, cancer is a living thing, right? We've made progress on it. But uh, the science using today, the non gertian science, a, for every stride we make towards it, it's producing 15 more carcinogens. Um, we also know Wendell Berry's work knows that this left brain way of doing science, the non gertian since it doesn't have the wisdom tradition, it doesn't know how to ask good questions for science, which necessarily implies wisdom. So for example, Wendell Berry would see young students coming down to his beloved Ohio River. Uh, they're probably coming down from Ohio State and they notice that, you know, a certain fish are dying. So uh, they jack it with one chemical to try and like change the, you know, the, the, what's going on in the water and they might create more problems. This is the way it works. But Wendell Berry knew from living for a long time or uh, near the banks of the Ohio River that he said, oh, there's a certain type of tree that used to live here that no longer does, right? So he could ask more fruitful questions. So, you know, Gertian, if nothing else, implies the kind of the wisdom, the right-brained, the whole, the organic, um, and the left brain. But cancer, again, Owen Barfield was great on this, that cancer is a living, and we need a different form of science to get after that. And that's just, for me, it's always an interesting question to ponder. That like everybody's life yes. has been touched by cancer. But, you know, Coleridge and all romantics said, you know, you have to kill or to divide. You have to slay in order to understand, like pin things on a board and dissect. And yeah. uh, there's another way, Larry. There's another way. I'll defer. Yeah. I, I, I agree. And before I go to Mike, uh, Michael Martin, I, I, I'll just riff on that and say the reason why I asked the question the way I did is because I I, I, I absolutely believe that reductionistic mechanistic science works within very narrow parameter to solve certain mechanistic problems, okay? Mm -hmm. If a problem is already inherently mechanistic, then of course a mechanistic approach, reductionistic approach, solves it or helps to solve it. But the, what we have done, and I like what you said, Mike, is to take that left brain reductionistic science and we've hegemonically elevated it to an absolute description and a methodology for everything. And so we might go to Mars, we might in fact, you know, develop fancy airplanes. But we have raped everything in the process right. and we have destroyed everything in the process. And at what cost, therefore, do we have these things? And have they then not robbed us of the wisdom as to why we want these things in the first place? And have they not robbed us of the wisdom to ask the right questions so that maybe we could put everything in a bigger context? In other words, reductionism cannot cannot embrace Goetheanism. But Goetheanism has an element within it where sometimes for the sake of the organismic whole, we need to look at the parts, but always with the whole in view. Um, and so it's a more expansive and inclusive scientific project, it seems to me. But anyway, down to Michael Martin. What 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 are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I I agree with all of the above. But uh, well, I think 
the biggest problem with the the scientific model which our our culture uses now is that the scientist is you know mir miraculously outside of nature and because of this and this I, this is not my idea this is something i got from a scientist david bohm oh yeah uh, quantum physicist and he he pointed out this is i think back in the 70s that now listen you know here's here's what happens with that scientific mentality of thinking you're outside of nature is that you create something through science say nuclear power plants or something else and then that creates another problem fukushima right then you yeah. have to create another scientific marvel to fix the problem caused by the last scientific marvel you created yes and it's it just cascades that way and i I tell college students or my own kids, you know, I said, well, look at all the problems in the world right now. What are the biggest problems? And it, they usually say pollution or whatever. All created by science. Yes. yes. <laughs> Every single one of them. Uh, there, I can't think of any problems that weren't created by science. All created by science. Yeah, that's true. Science and engineering, but, and, and, uh, but a, by a science and engineering <laughs> yeah. that sees itself as outside of nature which is oh, the yeah. fundamental flaw. Uh, but it's interesting. Now, I mentioned the 17th century earlier. So my dissertation, which was later published under the title Literature and the Encounter with God in Post-Reformation England, they tried to find a more boring title, but it was impossible, is uh, I did, there are chap I have a chapter on the, the Vaughns, but Thomas Vaughn was an alchemist. Henry Vaughn, his, real, his day job was, his, his, a, he was a physician. I did a chapter on Sir Kenelm Digby, who was a kind of Renaissance man, swashbuckler scientist. He was one. Of, he was one of the first people in the Royal Academy. Uh, he was a mystic, also. He was a Catholic apologist. And I also there's a chapter on John Dee, the Renaissance magician, uh, advisor to Elizabeth the First. So. Th what was interesting to me, it, and I did have a chapter in the Submerged Reality on Robert Flood, who was a, right. a scientist. And, but the thing is with all those guys I just mentioned, but especially with Flood and Thomas Vaughn, who were 17th century figures, and they saw what was happening because of the scientific revolution and thinking that man is a disinterested observer of nature. And they rejected that idea because it was anti-christian uh they they still maintain the idea of the macrocosm and its relationship to the microcosm right which is i think is a talk about a healthy relationship and this is what david bohm goes back to later when his idea of implicate order that yes. the whole is implied in the parts and the parts are implied in the whole i mean what a healthy paradigm that is uh, so i always wondered what would have happened had even though those guys were wrong about a lot of things, but but so was Robert Boyle, right? What would have happened? So it, so was Copernicus. So all those guys were wrong about a lot of things. What would have happened if that holistic model when the 17th century had been the prevailing model? And then I agree. As we move through history, of all the research funding went into that rather into rather than into the empirical dogmatic to torture chamber. I agree. Yeah, uh, David Bohm, I think, is very interesting. Uh, I've read him. And I read him after I was at a, a communio conference at the JP2 Institute in, in, in Washington because uh, David L. Schindler, the yeah. elder Schindler, has been a long uh, proponent and advocate of David Bohm's physics as having tremendous significance for the modern world, especially in that distinction he makes between the implicate and the explicate order, mm -hmm. which is very Balthazarian in its own way, which has always caused me to wonder, and then I'm going to get back to, to, to Mike Sauter and stuff, always caused me to wonder, you know, we spend billions and billions of dollars, right, on building these super colliders, like the Hadron uh, Collider so that we can discover ever <laughs> ever smaller particles that make up the you know the, the atomic uh, entity and and so suddenly they they announced you know three or four years ago hey we discovered the theoretical particle higgs boson is real we've discovered this fundamental building block of the material world and guess what 
it meant nothing. Uh, has it revolutionized our understanding of the universe? Has it revolutionized our understanding even of particle physics? No. It's like, okay, we spent $80 billion building this collider, and we discovered the Higgs boson. Now what do we do? Uh, and and it, it makes me wonder if it isn't just a monumental, it's, it, it isn't a temple to our stupidity to build these gigantic colliders to try and break nature down into its finer parts when we have had the whole staring us in the face. We're always reading about, well, there's a crisis in the current rating model of physics. Uh, we're not certain now that the standard model even works anymore. And yet we're spending still, we're, going back, Mike Sauter, about your thing about cancer and we're not asking the right questions, <clears throat> right? Are we not, when we're pouring billions and billions and billions of dollars into cancer research, now we've spent billions of dollars on these colliders and maybe all of it is kind of, all wrong headed and you know asking the wrong question anyway mike go mike Sauter. yeah I, i'll do i'll do maybe one and only today one of of our guys at the regeneration podcast one of our first interviews was with um guido preparata a name you and i talked about larry but at the end of it it was on it was on the future of economics but he was saying um when you talk about, the, I love, I loved what you just did, Larry, on the Higgs boson. I've festered on that. I still think that they even changed the nature of the thing they were looking for. They found probably did, but I yeah. was keeping up with that literate. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> we found something. We're going to call it the Higgs boson. But um, so, uh, but Preparato was saying, I guess of biomedicine, the areas of energy. These are the areas that keep people in power, right? So the switch to the Gertian method or the switch to other ways of healing cancer, you know, where's the profit motive, you know, and we could even bring in usury here. You know, that's, that's one aspect because we're wondering, you know, could we switch, you know, was, was all this made by those people who, you know, the faceless, it's not a small cabal. But like the profit motive, for sure, that was part of it. You know, Guido was saying his own dad, a world famous phys Giuliano Preparato. Look at look up his name and look up his name with uh, the name Richard Feynman. But they got into a big argument. And again, Larry, you were spot on over the standard model. Things that we're holding on to to hold on to the standard model. The other things are too great of a threat. Maybe energy is cheap. You know, maybe healing can be done with like water and other things. Things. You know, so that's why um, I also just want to put in a plug. There's a guy behind me, an early hero in a picture, Stephen Visenchi. He's uh, one of my first literary, uh, just I admired him so much. He was the Hungarian. Who, uh, he saw a technocratic government and he was there to start to uh, try to topple the statue of Stalin. I believe it was 1956 in Budapest, had to flee across the Adriatic, ended up in Toronto. He got to live with Joni Mitchell, got in a fist fight with Michael wow. Landon of Little House on the Prairie fame. <laughs> but he also, <laughs> you know, but he wrote these things that were like, you know, these things like in the Middle Ages, they didn't have potatoes, but maybe they didn't have suicide. I don't know how much of those are true. But he would say that um, he he could he could really hit on, on you know, that way. But he also gave me, he said, heavens, they are MFers, right? When you called it rape, you know, that when we think of some scientists, I love to think of scientists in a way that we're trying to single out scientists, but the rape of nature and so forth, you know, he would say, heavens, they are MFers. And he used the whole world there. And I love it, right? Because what we're doing to like yeah. earth in one sense of eternal principle, it's ubiquitous now, people are using it too much. I was substituting in public schools, the whole hallways are filled with too many expletives. But this, uh, you know, we need we need the Catholic Church to start attacking on this front a little more strongly. We're so again, it's the new religion. And to use Ilana Gilchrist's name one more time, the metaphor which is so meaningful to me is called the master and his emissary. Again, your language is great. One is more holistic, and it sends out this kind of scientific thing as an emissary to do some work. I pick up a tool and I use that tool for a specific thing. But certain was great on this. You know, I can pick up my pen, put it down. But a computer, that that tool that could be a tool for us or schools as a tool. You know, we can go to school to make this by sitting in a square room for 45 minutes with people our own age, you know, five days a week. But certain tools come back and then we become beholden to them, right? That we're 
we're wondering if on our uh, Gmail last night or on our phone. But the same thing with this um, this scientific hegemony, right? It's just shaped our yes. mind. So it was a tool. It came back and it shaped our whole mind. In Blake's God called Urizen. And I can't say enough about that. We need that name and we need to study Blake. And so even when we try to think outside the left brain, we're still so often in ways to do it, I'm afraid. Oh, we are. And uh, it's Sophia a power. Gets us out of this. It's a mentalite. It's, it's, it's a powerful plausibility structure or what we used to simply call it. it's a powerful mythology uh, that we're fighting against. I mean, when I used to teach my students about this topic, uh, you know, so often you get that standard canard. Well, religions cause violence and so on and so forth. And so that's why the modern world has moved away from religion, because religion causes violence, even though that's sort of been uh, kind of kind of debunked. But what you know, what it, bo what it boils down to is what they're appealing to is the Enlightenment's myth of origin, which is essentially a myth of original violence that that modern secular government and societies and the technocratic impulse arise as a re as a reaction against the violence of religion, that we are we have to do this in order to impose a certain Esperanto of scientism. Uh, that we all speak the same mathematical left brain language. And that's the only form of public discourse that is allowed. But I asked my students, hey, look, um, was it a sign? What was it? A, a, was it a priest that uh, developed Zyklon B that aided the Nazis to gas millions of people, especially Jews? No, it was a scientist aiding and abetting a horrible regime. Uh, was it a Protestant minister that invented the nuclear the atomic bomb which the united states then used to incinerate hundreds of thousands of japanese no scientists working with a secular government was it uh, a rabbi that invented and weaponized anthrax you get the point and i would say to them and it goes to the, the comment that mike uh, mike martin made about scientists existing outside of their realm of what it is that they're studying uh, they, outside of nature they stand therefore outside of reality and therefore outside of the moral realm as well. And so what we're dealing with is a powerful nihilistic mythology in the modern world that can only be countered by a re-mythologizing uh, of our own imagination uh, and, and, and aided and abetted by this sociological tradition, as well as literary figures like Tolkien and others. So Mike Martin, I, I know you've written a lot uh, about um, Big Pharma you know, it's very Ivan Ilyich, right? You know, the contra, the, the modern mm -hmm. establishment of education, big pharma. I, I want to really get kind of dicey here now, building off Mike Sauter's comments and what I just said. What, what role does this entire mythology play in the current sort of hysteria, let's call it that, over COVID, <clears throat> over big pharma, the vaccine mandates, lockdowns? What, what is your... What is your take on all of that? And, 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 and then sort of extend that and connect it with sort of our technocratic mind in, in general. Well, well, so that mythology, that's a mythology that needs to go, <laughs> first of all. Yeah. Um, but, I, but I think that, that we saw that, I mean, two and a half years ago almost, right? Where uh, two weeks to flatten the curve. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. And I'll don't touch your face. The scientists said so. And we, we can, we've seen how many times now. I knew they were wrong then. I knew they were wrong then. And they've they've proved themselves wrong. I mean, right lately, you've been, you've been seeing these uh, re uh, recirculated news clips from a year ago from the CDC and Anthony Fauci and people like this who are saying, if you take the vaccines, you won't get COVID. <laughs> which is a joke right but we knew it wasn't true then and but if you and, and the funny thing is is you have all these uh multinationals like you know social media you know they're all plugged into into the government and i and i remember this has got to be 12 years ago 10 12 years ago um seeing uh articles in the news about the disturbing trend of people moving from government you know positions into facebook yeah. yeah like who couldn't figure out what was going on with that and that's exactly what it's, what it's become right and so so you have that whole technocratic paradigm uh which unfortunately for the still i know a lot of people who just have bought it hook line and sinker right um yeah, so you have that, but but I think some people are starting to 
wait a second. This is this is dumb. We can't keep. And so and I wrote about this in Transfiguration, which I think came out in 2017, 2018, where uh, I saw it coming. And I and I knew that uh, the the world that we've been pretending to live in is unsustainable. Right. If this is unsustainable, I think the bad guys know, know it's unsustainable, too, which is why I think they're in a hurry to to get to the end game but the only antidote as far as i'm concerned is you can call it so uh, sophiology if you want it doesn't have to be called that but uh a relationship to the real as mike has been talking about that and which in the relationship to the real is a relationship a holistic relationship to nature and that's why i became a farmer but also uh more of an authentic uh, relationship to community and conviviality, uh, which I think that is the only way to get past this. I mean, I, I Mike and I often in our podcast uh, use the example of the Amish because we both live in areas where there are a lot of Amish and they have it down. I mean, they have their relationship to the community, to, to human flourishing, to the land. The Bruderhof, yeah. Yeah, it's very solid, very, very, and, and very Bruderhof. human. It's very, very human. And that's why they don't want to participate in, in the fake world that we're, we're, we're participating in. They don't like it because they see it's, it's madness, right? Yeah, it's crazy. And I wonder, um, to connect, I, I wonder to... To what extent this is also connected up with, um, well, before I go to that, because I'm going to come back to Mike Sauter, this thing about vaccines, uh, I, I have a friend uh, who lives in England, London, and we were talking on the phone the other day, and he said that he, you know, he's, he's had both two vaccine shots and a couple of boosters, and he now has COVID. And he knows hundreds of people that are there in a similar situation. Uh, and, and his, so he, he said to me, my goodness, what good is this vaccine? It doesn't keep you from catching COVID and it doesn't keep you from spreading COVID. So what is the rationale behind the whole vaccine mandate? And, and it's thinking, if not this notion that there must be, there has to be a technocratic answer to this problem. Mm -hmm. And that is also going to make us billions, if not trillions of dollars in the process when as you said so clearly michael martin we, we've known for a long time that the vaccines don't work but then we're told yes but if you get the vaccine if you catch covid it won't be as bad well i'm unvaccinated i have covid it wasn't very bad at all i've had worse head colds for crying out loud mm -hmm. uh and i know a lot of people in that same situation yeah. i'm not a covid denier covid's real what i'm wondering is this though and then i'm gonna go back to mike Sauter. And what and bring it into preparata in, into this as well. And to what extent, in other words, I'm not a QAnon conspiracy guy, but I am a big believer in a fundamental idea. Our government lies to us. It lies to us so often, so endemically, that it has almost forgotten how to tell the truth. And therefore, and this is an insight from the theologian Paul Griffith that he was making against George Weigel in a debate about whether or not the United States should go to war against Iraq. Paul Griffith said, absolutely not, because we have no idea whether or not the pretext for war that our government is giving us is even true, because our government does nothing but lie to us constantly. So I'm wondering, to what extent is this whole COVID thing not also a symbol, a very real symbol, of this whole technocratic impulse and how that technocratic impulse is tied up with late degenerate capitalism and Anglo-American empire building. Uh, and, and that goes into, I think, Preparata's argument as well. So Mike Sauter, can you maybe comment on that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. I mean, again, it's so funny. You know, everything teeters on everything. I'm with you 100% on everything, Larry, that I think many of us could agree that everything we are saying teeters on something that maybe all of us or some of us in any given area could think could go, go too far. I agree with you. Um, uh, and, um, but yeah, the government lies all the time. You know, and the other one too is, uh, yeah, the Anglo-American empire. That's why it's so we got to have like John Milbank and Adrian Pabst on here. <laughs> Cause when we, when we talk about political theology, yeah. you know, this stuff is starting to get very real in our time. My idea is like always come from the bottom them up um the i guess to your to your point you know sophiology 
it will, if you, so I live in a very, you're both, uh, you're both connected directly to farming. I'm an avid gardener, but I used to work on a dairy farm. You know, could we posit that if you were, if you were milking, cow, you know, and you were outside working with these things, there could be a survey. You know, one thing we can't test is all those people who said, I had five, 15 shots, I caught COVID, but I'm so grateful that I know it would have been so I didn't have the shot. <laughs> we'll never yeah, fully know yeah. the answer to that question. No, we won't. But we could do, but we could do a pretty good scientific survey to say that are people who are connected with nature in a meaningful way, or people who haven't sat too long in these institutions called schools are less likely to buy the whole thing, you know, about uh, the government lying to us. You know, that, um, you know, I used to, before my wife and I had any TV, we again moved out to the country and there was a, a local kind of shock jock who was uh, praising, you know, as Rod Dreher did, you know, and Dreher, at least, I, think, I want to give them all the accolades in the world. But um, was praising, you know, the bombing of Iraq and the weapons of mass destruction. But as we as we started, like so quickly having one side of the Russia narrative, like a too simplistic good guy and bad guy story. Sometimes I do want to pull out my own bona fides, which are old cassettes of me calling this uh, this local this jockey in Rochester saying, wait, brother, we, we don't have any evidence. We don't have any evidence of the weapons of mass destruction. Can we at least slow down? But um, so, and with my, I guess my fundamental point is, I guess we could have a scientific, to give sci scientists do, a scientific test to say, are those people who are connected to nature, who are connected to community, less likely to be dependent on government lies and to see through them quicker. I've got money, so I could gamble. I'm not a gambler, but I'm going to bet a lot of money. That's so true. That's so true. One final thing is that all these things, if we look at uh, the Patriot Act and so forth, you know, that the term, um, you know, Agamben uses the state of exception, but the, there's another term that as much, it's a shorthand, but an emergencyocracy, right? That whether, you know, COVID oh, real, it. was it bio- yeah, emergencyocracy, that no matter what, they're going to use an emergency to get more control. All agree on that, folks. Can we all agree on that? I, I love that. I have, is that from Agamben, emergency? I saw it from uh, my degrowthers in Europe, this whole, like, kind of leftist. Oh, I became part great... of my writing book reviews. They called some one of them called it, yeah, emergencyocracy. I love that because uh, I think one of the great eye-opening experiences for me here in Pennsylvania uh, was uh, uh, when COVID hit, was this r sudden realization that apparently the governor of the state of Pennsylvania has the power through executive order, this, this simply moving his pen across a piece of paper, uh, shutting down everything. Yeah. I never, you know, all in the name of an exigent circumstance, a, you know, a medical emergency. So now all of a sudden, based on some legislation buried decades ago that gave the governor these these powers of executive decision. Whole businesses, whole schools, churches, places of worship, everything except Walmart and 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 uh, maybe abortion clinics, stay you know are closed down, shut down. He even shut down the state liquor stores, which really drove me nuts. <laughs> but uh, you know, uh, just it was tragic. I ran out of bourbon, and that was tragic. But my friend Cyrus Brewster in Connecticut. I That's when you join the Pennsylvania militia. That's right. Oh yeah, except those guys are right wing crazies. I don't know. But to go back to your point, though, about about lying, I, I want to and I want to come back to Michael Martin about this, about government lies. For example, you, you, you bring up the whole Russia thing. Yeah. I mean, based on the, the standard narrative that I have seen on the news, I, I have very little doubt that Russia has engaged in an unjust aggression against Ukraine and that the Ukraine, despite the fact that it's not perfect, has every right to defend itself. And maybe the American government has every right and NATO has every right to send them arms. And Putin is the bad guy and the expansionist and a sort of crypto Hitler. But I don't know any of that to be true simply because I can't trust whether or not the information that I have gotten about that situation is true because our mass media are corrupted. I don't, you know, once again, I don't want to sound like some sort of tinfoil hatted QAnon conspiracy nut, but the fact is government lies. Journalists lie, all in the back pocket of big money, technocratic interests, and and so mm -hmm. I'm gonna. But I want to turn it back over to then to, to, to Michael Martin about uh, what are what are then some what what are some 
potential things that we can do to resist this emergencyocracy, to resist this uh, this technocratic impulse that has overwhelmed us? Well, I think you know, small is beautiful, is is where to start. I mean, that's what we do. I mean, how much can you do, right? Yeah. I. Uh, but but I think you, you have to start where you are and don't have and it can be overwhelming to try to think you're going to do some big thing. So um, so for me, we have our farm. We do a we do a CSA, right? Community supported right. agriculture. So that gets people into connection with the farmer and where their food's coming from. And so that's that's very simple. But also we have done a real um we make a real effort to celebrate the christian festivals in as convivial way convivial a way as possible here on the farm so one of our big ones is michaelmas we, we do a big michaelmas harvest celebration in september very good and actually we're getting ready to do saint john's day saint john's eve we'll be jumping over ask. fire and uh that just these little things where it builds up and it was interesting and I've mentioned this on the, on the podcast before, but so we also do May Day, which isn't a Christian festival, but it's Christian enough. And most Christian, most Christian, uh, most Christians in Euro European history celebrated every year, the first day of May. So we do that and we have a Maypole dance, kids come, a lot of fun. I mean, it's so much fun. But the interesting thing was, is that, so when COVID hit uh, and everything was shut down by government decree and by government, you know, governors, our, our governor here in Michigan was the same as yours in Pennsylvania, shut all these businesses, right? So at that, that May Day was not as well attended as usual. And, but the, th the funny thing was, and, and, the, and the following Michaelmas, not a lot of people came either because it, it was bad weather too. But the following May Day, so it's 2021, people, and we were still shut down in Michigan, I think. You know, so we were yeah. had still restricted gatherings and stuff. 50 people showed up at my farm with their, you know, a lot of young families with little children because they had heard through the grapevine about, about what was going on. And they were drawn to it. And people, I, it, you know, so we have like a, we had to do the make whole dance. And then we have a, like a potluck. And during the potluck, people were coming up to me and said, man, this, we have been waiting for this. We've been looking for this because this feels <coughs> what it, we feel like we're human again. Right. Right. And right. that was a big, I think one of the, and, and this is one of the things so many people didn't attend to over the course of this bizarre response to this to this virus is that the first thing to go was being human and what is the what is the most human experience but to see a person face to face yes i had some students this last semester i teach part-time at a local liberal arts college um I had a couple students, even though the, the college did not have a mask law the whole year, which was God bless them for that. I had a couple students who didn't not wear a mask the whole second semester. And it I don't know what they look like. And it's such a weird thing to be a professor. And they're not huge classes, maybe 14, 15 people, you know, to not know what your students look like. You know, so how do yeah. we experience one another? You know, and, and what happened, so the year before that, they, there was a mask requirement. And usually by the third week of class, I can I know everybody's name. I never learned anybody's name that semester. Right, right. I was it's always just, going off my yeah. book there, right? But yeah, that so that that's so it's chilling if you think about it. And and that has been uh a, a normal experience. I mean, and think about children, little children who've only had that experience of other people. Yes. It's, it's inhuman. It, and, and and I think part and parcel with all that stuff, we had, you know, 2020, all those crazy, insane riots all over the country, right? Where stores are ransacked, government buildings are attacked. 
nobody talks about it, right? We act like it didn't happen. <laughs> yeah. And then, then accompanying that, and I actually I knew it would happen once the Democrats Democrats got back into power. Then you you have the trans thing going to hyperdrive. And I was and, uh, while you were talking earlier, and I'm just lately when thinking in the in the 17th century in England during the Civil War, which and even if you go from the Reformation to the Civil War, it was basically moving things away from a convivial kind of Catholic, Catholic small and and capital C yeah. experience of the world to a more top down experience of the world. It made it even worse when the Puritans came into power, and and we have Puritans in power right now, right? Oh, uh, they just do. don't go to church. <laughs> yeah. So so what ha- so around that time there was a there was a great ballad called "The World Turned Upside Down." Yes. Which is where we are right now. I mean, we have been in that position for a while right now, and so to resist that, you do the little things. I at least because you can't change the system, so. Yeah. As Mike and I talked a couple weeks ago on our podcast, this is where you come to the idea, which I got from Vaclav Havel, of the parallel polis, right? Yes, yes, yes. So that that I think you got you have to do that. Yeah. Or even some people um, I, I've heard um, suggesting to somehow go to local currencies as well, to be as parallel as possible. Yeah, my wife was telling me the other day that they have like a local currency in Ithaca, New York. Yeah, I heard about it. Yeah. Yeah. You know, where you you get a high, you can turn in your dollars or whatever, and you get Ithaca money, which is valued a little higher than the dollar. And then you use Ithaca money to, you can only shop locally, which I think is a a sort of, I don't know how extensive the system is there, but that's an interesting idea. But I like the idea of a sort of, of a sort of subversive polis, a a counter polis. I, you know, as a Catholic worker, my attitude has always been that the current, whether or not she really said this or not, the filthy, rotten system that, that we currently live in is truly that. Whether or not she really, Dorothy Day said it or not, is irrelevant to me. It is a filthy, rotten system. And therefore, any, any version of Christianity that is not subversive of that system in some way, shape, or form is probably not an authentic form of Christianity. It's propping it up. Yeah, it's it's yeah, it's you're either propping up the status quo or you or you're subverting it. And I think to go back to my notion that we're fighting a powerful mythology, we need to fight it with an even more powerful mythology. And we need to reignite uh, to go to Mike Sauter's point, the right brain, the imaginative capacity of of Christians in the modern world to to in a sense energize them and to make them realize that their instincts are sound if they think this is all insane. And their instincts are proper and that they that they are part of a subversive movement by doing something as simple as recognizing the as you said the importance of a face the importance of not shutting down society technocratically by the stroke of a pen over a a fairly non-lethal virus you know this isn't the bubonic plague we're talking about here Mm -hmm. uh and so yeah i i think my 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 big thing is that you know it's always what's that cliche did darkest just before the dawn or whatever you know um mm-hmm. th- that yeah. we, we might think it's hopeless but it isn't it's a simple question as i often say of flipping the script and it, you've seen it mike Sauter has seen it i've seen it in the classroom in small microcosmic ways you flip the script of that mythology and propose a counter mythology and it can ignite the fire of the imagination instantly like that and change a person's life boom like that so what we're proposing isn't some esoterica, some weird, bizarre thing that few people can do. Uh, you know, something as simple as Mike Sarter having a garden or you and I starting a little farm. Uh, these are not impossible things to do. And I think parishes need to be more involved in, in, in doing these kinds of things. But anyway, Mike Sauter, we're, we're sort of we're, we're we've been on, uh, on for about an hour and 10, hour and 15 and for the sake of the processing capacity of my computer, I don't like to go <laughs> to, too far beyond that. But M- Mike Sauter, I, I'm, I'm fascinated by this guy, Preparata. Now, you've had him on your show, your Regeneration podcast, right? Mm-hmm. Twice. Yeah. 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 So um, what what is Preparata's sort of take on everything with regard we've been talking about today with regard to sociology, 
the the path of imminence, the implicate and explicate order of Bohm, um, the the reconstruction of the feminine aspect and the right brained aspect of our society uh, about the importance of confronting reality as it is, and the powerful mythology we face. I'm just fascinated by Preparata's notion of empire, uh, that that you know, is, is the Anglo sort of American empire. What is Preparata's take on, on everything we've been talking about today? Yeah, he, he would agree, you know, he stumbled into it in his own being raised by, again, you know, a genius level a physicist, physicist at Princeton and then, yeah, yeah. Giuliano Preparata. And he, he was given a very education over in Italy and he happened to be born with a pretty naturally kind of a gifted mind, but he, all of a sudden he started sniffing out that the stuff he was learning Nobody was practicing. Then the stuff he lies. Then he just jumped in. So like he discovered all these people. Like when he discovered Thorstein Veblen, you know, just certain books just opened his eyes so much. But he does, he does have a different telling of the whole thing. And it would be so if we think Anglo-American, let's just say the power of the technology right now, right? Who wants to, who's controlling technology? This is a theme of the end of the Faustian empire. I'm going to Oswald Spengler here, Preparat. I've never heard him mention Spengler. But, uh, you know, at this phase, who's controlling that technocratic structure? He'll call it, you know, a, a, the techno structure. He'll mention that. And there's essays on his website about that. But uh, it's a learning curve and it, it, it's a completely alternative understanding of, say, World War II. But like what you if you listen to one of these podcasts, Larry, or you've read some of this stuff that Michael Martin knows playing with like a great humanitarian in the best sense of the word. You know, there's that old black comedy joke that if a vegetarian eats vegetables, what does a humanitarian eat? Um, and that <laughs> I use that these humanitarians like. Hans Kung, right? These humanitarians that like fit into Dostoevsky's, the more I love humanity, the more I hate my neighbor. But they're still, you know, Guido grew up in with his family. He's somebody who kind of just, he, and he, the, the other key question that we'll find lots of great thinkers, I think all of us, people are wondering what happened to the left, right? You know, Jonathan Haidt talks about the different temperaments of the left and the right. Well, I'm a leftist from head to toe. I can't keep my shirt tucked in. Students dress up for me like Halloween because they know me as the campus minister. Every costume that they're done uh, invariably includes a, a fly that's down, right? You know, I'm just, I don't, I'm just, I'm a born kind of leftist. So is Guido. But the, the, the question for people who are born with like a liberal is to say like, whatever happened to dissent? Whatever happened to the left? Why did the left now become an intelligence agency, big pharma agency, loving, war loving, and group of people? You know, and I think his book called The Ideally, Ideology of Tyranny, uh, he also, as a man of the left, just saying, what happened to the left? So I guess I'll leave. No, that, yeah, I know, agree. I mean, I have a question I'm, that opens so many doors. But, yeah. I'm, I'm 63 years old. And so. You know, I was mm -hmm. 10 years old at the height of uh, in 1968 of the Tet Offensive in Vietnam, of the civil rights movement. We've lived through the assassinations of both Kennedys and Martin Luther King, riots in, in the streets. And I remember growing up being leftist as well in my bones. I mean, you it was in the air. I mean, you were you were in favor of civil rights. You were against the war in Vietnam. You were anti-war and pro-environment. All this. And, and and I I've often oh and you were concerned with things like world hunger. <laughs> and corporatism and you know you were a kind of small as what, what yeah. was the hippie what was the hippie movement if not in some ways a kind of small as beautiful movement all right and and, <clears throat> and yet overnight yeah. something happened something yeah. really happened and it all <laughs> went to seed and they all became investment bankers and technocrats yeah. <laughs> uh, uh and and so yeah something really really sad well here well so, you know what my so i've been married for 30 years and uh my wife and I always remarked that when we got married, we were pro organic farming, suspicious of government, suspicious of big pharma, wouldn't, you know, didn't want to vaccinate our kids. And uh, we're, we're really suspicious of it. And, and people thought we were lefties. Yeah. <laughs> we we're into homeschooling yeah. too, right? Into homeschooling. Yeah. People thought we were lefties. We haven't changed. But now, if I, if I list off my 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 uh, 
personality trait in that way. People people assume I'm I'm conservative. That's I'll right. Talk about, that's the world turned upside down, right? Absolutely. Dorothy Day had the same thing. I mean, all her life she was pegged yeah, as a crypto yeah. Marxist and a liberal and all that. I and mean, if you were to actually now today uh, introduce the writings of Dorothy Day to your your typical woke lefty they would consider her to be a, a troglodytic right-wing Neanderthal from hell, yep. mm -hmm. uh, hopelessly bigoted, hopelessly retrograde, hopelessly reactionary. And yet she, she hadn't, I mean, she, obviously she's deceased, but, you know, her, her ideas are, 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 are out there for all to read. And then, you know, well, one era she's a liberal, now she's a reactionary. And I, I, I feel the same, the same in, in my life. I say, I've said certain things on this show here today where, some viewers are go, oh God, he's a transphobic bigot, and you know doesn't believe it. But you know, you know, we we I'm not a right winger uh, at all. Uh, but that such is our world today. Hey, such I'm I'm going to have world. to wrap this up. Uh, I I feel like we could just talk for hours and hours and hours okay. uh, about this stuff. Um, I I did have one last question. I wanted to ask uh, Michael Martin, and now it is eluding me. I'm sure I'll think of it as soon as I stop recording. I think it had something. Oh, I know. I wanted to ask both of you before I sign off. It, and I hate to be like a one-trick pony here talking about preparata, uh, but in some of the things I've read from him, what one and it opens up a bigger question, and maybe we could do a whole different podcast just on this. What role has the Vatican played, do you think, in either – opposing or promoting the sort of technocracy uh, that we are lamenting here today? I think that the, I think that the Vatican is the model, you know, for good or, I mean, and I, and I just like, I think uh, in the, in the way to change a culture, look to uh, 16th century England in the, in the power structure there, how to change a cult, how to change an entire culture from Catholic to Protestant without, without mass media. Yeah. And so, and, and, to, and using propaganda to do it. Um, so I think that's true, but I think the, the Vatican is probably the model for the, for the, the, the paradigm for the technocracy, not that the Vatican has always done this, but it, it's, it's a, it's a tight system controlled from the top. And it, it uses bureaucracy very well. Yeah. And not that, and when I say very well, I mean, I don't necessarily mean for the good. Right? Yeah. And it also seems like they're obsessed with their own diplomatic status as, as some mm -hmm. sort of player, a player in the modern mm -hmm. geopolitical sphere. Right. And uh, I mean, and that's that goes back a ways with, with concordats and agreements. Mm -hmm. so, but but, that, but the, with the demise of things like concordats, which privilege the church, it seems as if the church now these days has positioned herself as simply uh, a baptizer of the liberal order uh, and, and a player in that liberal order as yeah. a sort of neutral observer, the sort of religious Switzerland that can then intervene. When So Mike Sauter, what, what is your take on that? Yeah, like I like the image and he he would never, and I myself, and he would never say there was an official document signed but the notion that the church has in some way now fully agreed to be like the Catholic Charities wing, the Caritas wing of the, the order, right? That yeah. um, they can go, they can try and help clean up Ebola in Africa. They're willing just to be, you know, like, so I used to run a parish. And then when I worked in a downtown town parish, you know, right. we had right. in the downtown parish, we had nobody coming to church, but we were so glad we had a soup kitchen. You know, what? soup kitchen's good. But um, that's kind of where we are. You know, I don't uh, think the Vatican gets around to the big questions, but like we we can help we can help get food to places. We can be conduits to get the rice that's trapped or the wheat that's trapped in Ukraine to Africa. Go ahead. Hey, no, no, correct me if I'm wrong. Didn't Guido say one time when we were talking to him, and not, not this is a while ago, that and it was, it was a brilliant observation that basically the agreement between the powers in the Vatican is okay. You do this stuff, and we'll leave you alone about the about the child sex abuse, because that hasn't been in the news for a yeah. while, has it? Well, not only has it not yeah, been that, in the well, news. Yeah, well, let's say so. Well, France, remember, came out with a lot more allegations recently. That had been developed for a long time. But his kind of scientific hypothesis uh -huh. is that 
that when quote unquote, the agreement was kind of done, you know, that like the church had tried under Benedict to kind of reassert itself. And now that there's kind of a, a further capitulation that he could intuit, he said the evidence of this would be, say, after you won't see Catholics portrayed as like just backward, cretinous, um, child molesting, cesspools of, of ignorance any longer from the media. Media, not saying it was that the you know that this thing, the Boston Globe stories, true, horrible, but they were kept in abeyance until the Catholic Church was you know going to start questioning some of the geopolitical going on. Then the Boston Globe you know releases those, mm. but all of a sudden, like the New World Order, this thing had you know been able to kind of just batter the church into submission. Finally, there was a submission. In sense, proof of this submission would see. That the because we capitulated, you won't you wouldn't see as much. You know, Philip Jenkins called uh, that book, you know, Catholicism, the last acceptable. Uh, you might yeah. not see this kind of like holding up the Catholic Church and all those people as the emblematic, backward, homophobic, everything that it was. So that's mm -hmm. a testable again, scientific. Okay. Interesting. It's very interesting, it's right. especially, yeah. especially. But, you know, so right after that, the French clergy. Yeah, yeah. Well, and especially when you look at the fact that it is now well known, I think pretty well documented uh, through various leaks and so on, that the CIA has plants in almost every major American newsroom and, oh. uh, and, and, and newspaper, sure. newspaper, television. I mean, that there are actual that many of the big TV personalities that you see in the, in the news media are in fact trained by the CIA. Now, that sounds crazy. That sounds lunatic. I would never have believed it in a million years. But then I'm reading article after article written by ex-CIA agents who say, yeah, it's true. It is absolutely true. So I would have dismissed, Mike Sutter, what you, what they're, you just they're said. They're right on the media. You see John Brennan and all these people. Yeah, no, they're, yeah. they're right on the media now. Again, uh, MSNBC yeah. and CNN, and I'm not promoting Fox News. Don't watch it. They're just telling us to... <laughs> I know. Uh, exactly. All right. Well, sort See, of uh, my politics. Yeah. And uh, so anyway, all of us tinfoil yeah. hat wearing types, I guess. <laughs> I guess we are. I guess. Hey, we guys, are. this. Uh, well, we're not. That's, that's God bless crazy. I, yeah. And uh, I yeah. thought this was a great conversation. I hope everybody Me too. did. Too. Me too. Me too. Uh, thanks, everybody, for watching. And maybe we'll have these two uh, yahoos on the show again <laughs> in, in, in the not too distant. All that's right. Thanks a lot, guys. Thank Bye -bye. you. Yeah, Bye -bye. thanks, Larry. Thanks, guys. Yeah, we'll see you. <laughs>